So when they say metabolism, they are, they are referencing the security of metabolic abnormality. Maybe acquired causes due to hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, or hypoglycemia, or they can be inherited enzyme deficiency. So when we say inherited disorders, these are disorders due to genetic defects which code for enzymes involved in converting various substrates into products. Failure of these enzymes to perform their intended function leads on to either a deficiency of the substrates essential for cellular metabolism or membrane function, or they can lead to intracellular accumulation of toxic substances, or it may lead to an alteration of the intracellular osmolality. So when they are due to acquired causes, we usually call as active symptoms, or maybe a renal dysfunction, a renal failure, So those are called asymptomatic seizures. But when these uh, recurrent seizures are due to metabolic which over enzymes, and we lead up to seizures, seizures, we call them as metabolic epilepsy. So these disorders, they share certain common features. They usually have, they have an early age of presentation, either in the newborn period or in infancy, and usually they are refractory to conventional anti-seizure medicines. Conventional uh, anti-epileptic drugs are typically ineffective as they do not address the root cause. And again, there is one more common feature. No seizure pattern specific to these disorders. They, they present as a generalized seizures, focal seizures, myoclonic, theater, epileptic spasms, aortic seizures, drop attacks, any seizure pattern can occur. And usually they have a comorbid developmental delay or development regression, intellectual disability, or fatal impairments. And we need to know all these things. Why there is a need to recognize this metabolic epilepsy is some of these disorders are available to the treats and early treatment optimizes the outcome, hence timely diagnosis and a prompt diagnosis and a prompt uh, management is critical. So we can classify them according to the pathogenesis, either energy deficiency under this category, we can respiratory disorders, respiratory disorders, complex one to complex five, creatine deficiency syndrome and the glucose transport deficiency. Toxic accumulation of toxic substances, uh, exams in organic acidemia, amino acidopathies, urea cycle defects, disturbance of neurotransmitter function. Actually, there are, I think there are two uh, either a phone and a system in your room, it's echoing. You can mute one, one unit. And please show that slides in full screen. Slides in full screen. Tarek, can you adjust that slide to, so that it can be shown as a full screen? Um, it, uh, sir, we can't control from here, sir. Okay. Is it now uh, seen now uh, full screen? No, ma'am, it's not in full screen. Not in full screen. Uh -huh. One minute.
you please mute one mobile phone or we are getting an echo dima ah yes yeah. Is it now seen full slide, uh, full yes. screen? Yes, ma'am, full screen, yeah. ma'am. Yes, thank you. Papa, papa. Pa. So according to the age of onset, we can classify them either in the neonatal and uh, early infancy period during which we can have pyridoxin dependent epilepsy, pyridoxin phosphate oxidase deficiency, otherwise called the pyridoxal phosphate deficiency, folinic acid responsive seizures, biodilinase deficiency, GLUT1, molybdenum cofactor, meningitis, non-thetatic hyperglycinemia, other conditions such as organic acidemia, urea cycle disorders, paroxysomal disorders, neuronal serial lipofishnosis. Whereas in late infancy and during childhood, we have commonly creatine synthesis defects, neuronal serial lipofishnosis, late infantile type, mitochondrial, GLUT1, congenital disorders of glycosylation, purine metabolism defects, folate metabolic errors, and neurotransmitter defects. Recognize the following eight group of disorders as metabolic epilepsy, namely biotidinase or polypoclase, pyridoxin dependent epilepsy, polynic response deficiency, cerebral folate deficiency, glucose transporter 1 deficiency, creatine deficiency disorders, mitochondrial and peroxisomal disorders as metabolic epilepsy. But in practice, we do see other patients also presenting as. Uh, mainly as features as the presentation. So today we shall see some of the disorders which have seizures as the main presentation.
Uh, let us see the case scenarios. Two month old female child, she is a parent, had a normal delivery, had a normal perinatal, period, normal perinatal transition, uh, developed as generalized seizures, about five to six episodes per day. There was no fever, loose tools, vomiting, or refusal of feet. There was no family history of seizures. On examination, there were no neurocutaneous markers or organically, chemical investigation. Sugar normal electrolytes and were normal. Ultrasonogram cranium was not contributory, and the child was started on phenobarbitone. And uh, the child was sent for three weeks after discharge. The child had drug and seizures, and at this point of time, the child was lethargic and uh, she has not done which she should have done by two months. And the ionization done this time was normal. The magnesium was also normal. Sea brain was done. It was not contributory. And CSF examination, including CSF sugar, was normal. And uh, clinical examination showed uh, lethargic child with uh, alopecia, staff scar in the bifrontal, uh, frontal and parietal regions. And you could see in the occipital region, you could see the sporic dermatitis. So, uh, based on the clinical examination, uh, two and a half uh, month old with recurrent seizures, not responding to the uh, phenobarbitone, which is the first line drug which we use in uh, infants, in neonates and uh, young infants, with the alopecia, sparse hair, and the seboric dermatitis, biodeterminase deficiency was suspected and biotin was added, 5 milligram in uh, BD dose. There was a dramatic response. Within 48 hours, the child became active, alert, and there were no more seizures. And the system of spectrometry revealed dehydroxyl carnitine, which gave us the clue that this could be this could be definitely a serum biotinase level. And the serum biotinase level was uh, ex uh, was tested in the serum, and it showed a severe deficiency. Normal level is uh, 29.46. 9.2 nanomoles. When it is less than 10% of the normal level, this is considered a profound efficiency. If the serum level is between 10 to 30% of the normal value, then it is considered a subpartial deficiency. So this kid fits into with the profound deficiency of serum biotinase. The deficiency is this has an uh, autosomal recessive inheritance with an incident of 60,000 to 1 lakh uh, live births. Usually, it presents in uh, during three months of neurological manifestations include the recurrent seizures, not uh, responding to conventional anti seizure medications, lethargy, hypotonia, developmental delay. There can be today's manifestations such as eczema, toric dermatitis, fast alopecia, which is the hallmark of this disease. Uh, babies can have blepharoconjunctivitis as well, and they can or apnea. These children can have developmental delay or sometimes even regression. Uh, in country, these children have plastic quadriparasis, paraparasis, optic atrophy, and the hearing loss. And uh, as we see the biotin cycle, biotin is the essential poster for four carboxylases, acetyl CoA carboxylase, which is uh, essential for fatty acidosis, phosphate carboxylase, which is necessary for gluconeogenesis, Propionyl CoA carboxylase, which is important in TCA cycle, and the methylcrotonyl CoA carboxylase, which is important for protein balance. And the function of the biotin enzyme is it leaves the free biotin from the protein bound form. And nutrition of the protein reduces activity of the biotinase, and this leads to decreased free biotin available carboxylase. So that's the now, these are apocarboxylases to holocarboxylases, resulting in the functional deficiency of multiple carboxylations. As you could see, biotin is uh, uh, present in uh, both vegetables as well as non meat, fish, liver, etc. And uh, this dietary biotin is both in the free form as well as the whole form. Free form enters into the biotin cycle straight away. And this holocarboxylase synthetase enzyme is important also. And this enzyme 
binds the biotin to the upper carboxylases and this enzyme is necessary for this this uh, carboxylases four carboxylases which i have mentioned these are in the upper carboxylase form or in the inactive form so this enzyme converts this inactive form to carboxylases that is the active form and for this biotin free biotin is necessary so the uh, the uh, function of this biotinase enzyme is it cleaves the biotin and it frees it from the protein bound form both exogenously as well as once this carboxylases they have done their functions they are proteolytically they are degraded to biocytin which is a lysyl form of biotin biotinyl lysine hence this biotinase is also essential to cleave uh, this biotin from this protein bound form or a biotinyl lysine form so whenever there is a deficiency of this enzyme this holocarboxyl there is a secondary functional deficiency of these holocarboxylases these are important for all, for all the three metabolism so the patient can have present the toxic accumulation of uh, this uh, byproducts lactate organic acids biocidin ammonia so this kids can present to us with severe a uh, high anion gap metabolic acidosis lactic acidosis ketosis and organic acidemia and the serum biotinase level is the uh, definitive test as i have mentioned earlier if it is less than 10% of normal it is profound deficiency if it is 10 to 30% of normal then it is partial deficiency and we have to confirm with mutation studies in the btd gene as which can help us in the prenatal counseling for the next baby so uh, pathophysiologically this lactate elevated lactate levels organic acid levels biocidin ammonia levels are responsible for the different neurological manifestations normalities in the lipid metabolism is responsible for the skin manifestation seborrhea seborrheic dermatitis alopecia and all so acidosis as you have a slight biotin acidosis metabolic acidosis gets corrected within hours and seizures and encephalopathy improves within 48 hours there, there won't be any more seizures and the manifestation also will result completely within days to weeks and developmental milestones improve as well but if untreated the child may develop optic atrophy and hearing loss and this is going to be irreversible and this is refractory to management hence it is better uh, biotinase deficiency is identified in the newborn period itself and newborn screening if the children are picked up in by newborn screening and early biotinase biotinase introduced early in the pre symptomatic phase itself these kids remain asymptomatic so reference just the spirit dermatitis and or alopecia think about biotinase deficiency early diagnosis and treatment prevent e coli and if the same clinical picture biotinase levels are normal then this could be a holocarboxylase case deficiency and this is all in a, has an autosomal recessive inheritance but the age group is a little different they can present to us with recurrent seizures in the newborn period or in less than 6 months of age and the symptoms are very similar and again here the treatment is large doses of biotin so when biotinase levels are normal one should consider polar carboxylase synthetase and proceed further to mutation analysis coming to the second case two old female child uh, presented to us with a general status epilepticus and it was a refractory status which required uh, first line drugs like lorazepam and uh, uh, levetiracetam and sodium valproate and uh, it did not get controlled with uh, these drugs and we had to go for metazolam drip even up to 10 to 12 mg per kg per minute and the child was ventilated for four days and uh, uh, she had a generalized tonic clonic seizure 20 days prior to this onset of uh, generalized status and she was treated with the phenytoin there in the local hospital and she was on oral phenytoin and uh, on detailed history taking mother revealed that the child had seizures in the newborn period she was on certain drugs till two months ago and this drug was stopped two months ago and the developmentally the child was normal there was no family infection so inter insisted on uh, bringing the old records and on perusing the old records we found that she is dramatically controlled and child gains and sodium within 48 hours and the mri brain was normal csf analysis including metabolic parameters were normal so since the child showed a dramatic response uh, to pain 
the time was on earlier thyroidoxin harder neonatal stuff both the thyroidoxin and seizures and we the plasma alpha amino and semi aldehyde and pipa folic acid and which were elevated so the moral is any refractory epilepsy in a child less than 2 years of age or in any age we have to consider patterns and uh, we did not proceed with uh, 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 this uh, mutation studies as uh, we had uh, uh, financial difficulty and uh, pyridoxin dependency is usually due to a mutation in the antiquating gene otherwise ald dhs 7a1 gene here this has an uh, implication of cerebral lysine metabolism uh, in the lysine catabolism lysine can undergo uh, metabolic degradation in uh, in two pathways one is pipicolic acid pathway through pipicolic acid pathway it is converted into piperidine 6 carboxylase uh, that is p6c or it can go via the sacropyne pathway in which it is converted to alpha amino adipic semi aldehyde and uh, at this level both are interconvertible the problem here is in the pyridoxin dependent epilepsy whenever there is a mutation in this gene this this encodes for this enzyme that is the alpha amino adipic semi aldehyde heterolysis so this becomes dysfunctional so all alpha amino adipic acid the semi aldehyde are interconverted to piperidine 6 carboxylase and this is the primary problem this inactivates the pyridoxal 5 phosphate as we all know pyridoxin is converted to pyridoxal pyridoxal phosphate which is the cofactor for more than 150 enzymes in our metabolism the hypothesis cause for seizures in pyridoxin dependent epilepsy is pyridoxal phosphate is an cofactor for gad that is glutamic acid decarboxylase which converts the glutamic acid to gaba so more excitotoxicity and uh, decrease inhibitory neurotransmitter hence this is supposed to be the cause for seizures in pyridoxin epilepsy pyridoxin dependent epilepsy typically presents in within hours of birth as an epileptic encephalopathy this can mimic hie because these kids will have on day one seizures itself on uh, at birth that is on day one within hours of birth can have, they can have lactic seizures so, so clinically they can mimic hie some mothers report unusual fetal movements that is increase the intrauterine and fetal seizures and again these kids can have any type of seizure partial generalized epileptic spasm some myoclonic atonic frequently they can go for uh, status epilepticus additionally they can have hypotonia developmental delay mri brain may show no specific findings of thinning of the corpus callosum or abnormalities so whenever we suspect uh, pyridoxin dependency uh, Just IV pyridoxin and IV with IV pyridoxin dramatically there will be a uh, complete cessation of any seizure. This can go for apnea. So uh, cardio respiratory arrest we have to uh, anticipate, and we should keep all uh, necessary precaution. We should take all necessary. other problem is that the IV pyridoxin uh, what we can do is the other alternate uh, management is we can give oral pyridoxin in the dose of 30 mg per day usually these pizza previously before uh, in olden days people used to diagnose and epilepsy through clinical criteria the clinical criteria include the children can have early onset recurrent seizures and pyridoxin and that will complete seizure with pyridoxin monotherapy after introduction seizures will cease and we should be able to take away the other anticonvulsants and child should be have seizure control or complete seizure
and the if uh, py once pyridoxine is reintroduced there will be a uh, they will regain seizure control so this was the clinical criteria previously people were using before this myo biomarkers are available and uh, genetic testing was available now with the uh, availability of uh, uh, biomarker testing as well as genetic testing withdrawal of uh, pyridoxine in the uh, responders is no longer relevant we can do uh, aasa that is alpha amino, amino adipic semi aldehyde in the plasma csf or urine which will be elevated and uh, in the plasma and the csf picolic acid will be also be elevated we can confirm the diagnosis by doing genetic uh, mutation studies in the antiquitin gene So once confirmed, these kits had to be on uh, pyridoxine 30 milligram per kg per day for lifelong. The maximum daily dose of 300 milligram in infants and up to 500 milligrams we can go for children, adolescent and adults. Lower doses will be able to uh, have a complete seizure control, but larger doses are necessary uh, for a cognitive improvement or a uh, better neurodevelopmental outcome. And during intercurrent illness, either having fever or uh, during intercurrent infection, we have to double the dose. Lima? And, uh, uh, yeah. We, your screen yeah. is not a, we can't see your uh, screen. Your slides. Uh, share, please share. Is it, uh, is it seen? Slides are seen now? No, ma'am. No, no ma'am, it's not seen, ma'am. Is it seen now? No, ma'am. Uh, no, it's... Is it seen now? No, ma'am. No, no, ma'am. It's not seen, ma'am. No, no ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, now it's seen, ma'am.
now it's seen ma'am it is seen now yes ma'am seen ma'am yeah so another uh, point of view is uh, you can have you can give lysine restricted diet which will reduce the level of the neurotoxic uh, alpha amino adipic semi aldehyde and again supplementation of arginine can be given which can uh, which can inhibit the lysine transport again reduces the lysine level so together all these three are called the triple therapy that is pyridoxine plus lysine restricted diet and uh, supplementation of l arginine and always we have to inform the parents and the and the older children that the compliance is critical this is going to be lifelong therapy and there is a high risk of status epilepticus on discontinuation of the pyridoxine therapy and always we have to monitor them for intellectual disability and language defects because even with uh, supplementation of pyridoxine these children can have some amount of the intellectual disability especially expressive language deficits also and uh, we should also remember high doses of pyridoxine supplementation can cause sensory neuro neuropathy this also has to be remembered and the next one is the folinic acid responsive seizures suppose when we are giving uh, pyridoxine suppose there is no uh, complete cessation of uh, seizures but there is a partial response then we have to consider folinic acid responsive seizure because these two disorders are considered to be genetically allelic disorder so in a neonate or an uh, uh, younger infant with seizures who can demonstrate an incomplete pyridoxine response we have to add on folinic acid in the dose of 3 to 5 mg per kg per day should be considered the next one is similar uh, folinic acid responsive disorder is a cerebral folate deficiency this is an entirely different one but this uh, this disorder also responds to folinic acid here there is an uh, mutation uh, in the fo folate receptor gene that encodes for the folate receptor here uh, though the plasma folate levels are normal csf 5 hydro 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate levels are very low these kids can present with intractable seizures developmental regression ataxia spastic paraparesis hypotonia progressive visual and hearing impairment the management will be folinic acid in the dose of 5 to 15 mg per kg per day lifelong and one point we have to remember is we have to avoid folic acid as treatment because some of the uh, 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 private practitioners will be giving folic acid but here folic acid tightly binds to the folate receptor and stops the transport of active 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate into the csf so folic acid should not be given but folinic acid which is other which is nothing but the formyl tetrahydrofolate this is available in the uh, in the market as a 15 mg tablet so we have to give folinic acid then the another related disorder is the pyridoxal phosphate deficiency and uh, here uh, these kids will have similar symptomatology refractory seizures in the newborn period or in the young infancy but they are not responding to pyridoxine but to pyridoxal phosphate so whenever there is no response to pyridoxine the next step will be if there is a partial response then we have to consider adding folinic acid suppose there is no response to pyridoxine at all then we have to think about pyridoxal phosphate deficiency here this is due to a pnpo deficiency that is pyridoxine phosphate oxidase deficiency this enzyme converts the phosphor uh, this uh, uh, pyridoxine and pyridoxamine to pyridoxal phosphate as we all know the active the active form or the active form of the pyridoxine is the pyridoxal phosphate which is essential for the metabolic uh, metabolic uh, reactions so this is clinically indistinguishable indistinguishable from pyridoxine dependent epilepsy but the seizures are resistant to regular or conventional anticonvulsants and pyridoxine and the trial which we have to give is a uh, pyridoxal phosphate in the dose of 30 mg per kg per day in three or four divided doses for three to five days we have to try here uh, the one more uh, distinguishing feature from pyridoxine dependent epilepsy that is anticodin gene deficiency is in the blood and the csf alpha amino adipic uh, semi aldehyde as well as pipofolic acid are normal but the csf may show decreased uh, homophalinic acid and the 5 hydroxy indolastic acid and we have to do gene uh, genetic mutation studies for pnpo mutation and it is going to be a lifelong therapy with the 30 to 50 mg per kg per day 
and uh, if larger doses are given it can lead to fetal uh, sorry uh, hepatic uh, hepatotoxicity so we have to monitor lft levels regularly once in 3 months coming to the case scenario 3 this is a 12 day old uh, term baby first born of third degree conception as parents who presented uh, with refractory seizures from day one of life it was a multiple episodes of seizures multifocal clonic myoclonic seizures during the antenatal period again the mother had increased fetal movements and this was a lses delivery with a birth weight of uh, 2.7 which is normal and uh, the child was lethargic had a weak cry had hiccups and uh, frequent apneic episodes there was no abnormal order of urine there were, there was no family history of seizures either and uh, uh, metabolic parameters including blood sugar ionized calcium magnesium were normal ultrasonogram cranium was normal and usually whenever the child uh, presents to us with the seizures and the lethargy and cephalopathy and all the neonatologists first consider a sepsis whether it is a uh, early onset sepsis hence they did a septic screening which was negative csf analysis including blood uh, including csf sugar was normal and empirical pyridoxine was given uh, no response Py pyridoxal phosphate we do not have and biotin trial was given it was no response and uh, abg was normal urine ketones were negative serum lactate ammonia were normal eeg showed a birth suppression pattern and the br mri uh, brain was done which showed a diffusion restriction in the posterior limb of internal capsule you could see a diffusion restriction in the bilaterally in the posterior limb of internal capsule and uh, we did not do the uh, mrs at that point of time uh, mrs was not included in the mri brain and this uh, the tms was sent and it showed a very high elevated glycine levels normal level was uh, up to 623 but this kid uh, had an 1362 micromoles per liter of serum glycine so uh, hyperglycinemia that is a uh, uh, urine ketones were negative hence a non ketotic hyperglycinemia was considered and the cs of glycine was done and it was also elevated it was 184 whereas up to 14 was normal and serum glycine again was elevated and when we uh, calculated the cs of uh, bar serum glycine ratio it was 0.45 the normal value was uh, is uh, less than 0.02 if it is elevated beyond the 0.08 then it is considered as uh, abnormal and if it is more than 0.2 then it is a classical non ketotic hyperglycinemia and the uh, seizures were controlled with the three anti epileptic drugs and then we uh, also gave sodium benzoate and dextromethorphan and uh, as you could see in this picture mrs can give us a clue it can show us a glycine peak so whenever the mri shows a uh, diffusion restriction pattern along the pyramidal tract as and if the MRS uh, shows a glycine peak then we have to consider non-ketotic hyperglycinemia so whenever there is a history of in increased or uh, increased fetal intrauterine increased fetal movements and the persistent hiccups in the newborn period refractory seizures MRS showing glycine peak and uh, then we have to consider non-ketotic hyperglycinemia now at uh, 10 months of age, her glycine levels are normal, but uh, she is uh, yet to follow light. There is no head control, no milestones are achieved. Child is having occasional seizures, having hypotonia with the preserved reflexes. So coming to non-ketotic hyperglycinemia, this is a deficiency of the glycine cleavage enzyme system and consequently accumulation of the glycine in the brain. Classical non-ketotic hyperglycinemia presence in the newborn period with the ref refractory seizures, hypotonia, feeding difficulty, encephalopathy, and apneic episode. Presence of hiccups in the newborn is an important clinical clue. Infantile form can present as a developmental delay, hypotonia, seizures, and MRS can demonstrate a glycine peak. If the CSF2 plasma glycine levels are more than 0.08, this is, a, this is diagnostic. We can confirm with a genetic mutation. So glycine is a, the basic pathophysiology is Glycine is an inhibitory neurotransmitter and on the glycinergic receptors in the brainstem as well as in the spinal cord, which could possibly contribute to the apneic episodes and hypotonia. And uh, glycine is again an allosteric activator of the excitatory NMDA type of glutamate receptors. Hence, this can cause, uh, this is uh, more excitotoxicity leading to seizures. So apart from the anticonvulsants, and uh, this is again, this is a uh, 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 IEM or, uh, or a disease, which is refractory to uh, conventional anti-epileptics, but uh, we can give sodium benzoate 
and uh, uh, which can convert the glycine to hippuric acid. It has to be given in the dose of 250 to 500 milligram per kg per day in three to six divided doses. And again, NMDA blockers like dextromethorphan or ketamine can be used in these kids. Dextromethorphan has to be given in the dose of three to 15 milligram per kg per day. This will reduce the seizures, not uh, the regular anticonvulsant, but uh, once introduction of dextromethorphan, we can have some control of uh, seizures and this will improve alertness also. And uh, sodium valproate as an anticonvulsant should be avoided in these kids, which because this sodium valproate can inhibit the residual enzyme activity, hence should be avoided. Coming to the fourth case scenario, this is a two and a half month old male infant who presented to us with the recurrent myoclonic jerks, about five to 10 episodes per day. There was no history of fever, lethargy, irritability, or refusal of feeds. But the child did not have any bad uh, uh, child rearing practices like uh, toxins given or uh, your neem oil, something like that, which can cause seizures. And this child had a generalized status epilepticus on the day two of admission. This is a firstborn uh, child of non consanguineous parents who had an, uh, who delivered by uh, cesarean section with a normal birth weight, normal perinatal transition, but at your time, social smile. A clinical examination did not reveal any dysmorphism, neurocutaneous markers or ergonomical. Metabolic parameters were normal. CT brain plane and contrast was normal. And the CSF analysis did not, uh, did not show any cells and the protein was normal. But we found that the sugar was low. Again, our uh, postgraduates, usually they send the CSF sample for all these things, culture, etc. And the latter subglutination test was negative. Culture uh, did not show any growth. Virological studies were also negative. So in the absence of CNS infection, clinically also there was no history suggestive of uh, uh, meningitis or encephalitis. There was no history of fever at all. But and, uh, the CSF analysis also did not show any evidence for infection. In such a scenario, if the CSF sugar is low, then we have to consider in such a children with the refractory seizure, GLUT1 transporter deficiency has to be considered. So the child was uh, started on levetiracetam and clonazepam, pyridoxin was added, there was no response, off the examination was not contributory, and a repeat LP with a corresponding blood sugar was advised, but it was traumatic, unfortunately. So the child was discharged with the, with the two anticonvulsants. But a uh, uh, child got readmitted within two weeks with again recurrent seizures. There was no history of abnormal startle or no abnormal odor of urine. Child had staring spells also occasionally. And MRI brain was done, which was normal. Serum magnesium was normal. Lactate ammonia was normal. TMS was uh, uh, negative. And the EEG showed a generalized epileptic form activity. So we repeated the CSF analysis with the corresponding blood sugar. The CSF sugar in the first instance was 29, but there was no corresponding blood sugar was done. So second LP showed an 30 milligram CSF sugar with a corresponding uh, 104 blood sugar. So the ratio was 0.28. And again, after four hour fasting, it was repeated. Again, the CSF sugar was low, but the CSF uh, blood sugar ratio was 0.3. And the CSF lactate was low. So it was a glute one transported deficiency. And this glute one transported deficiency, as uh, we neurologists know, this can have uh, multiple seizure types, uh, generalized seizures, spasms, infantile spasms, atypical absence, myoclonic seizures, myoclonic astatic seizures, and the epileptic spasms also are uh, even states epilepticus it can present to us. And the other manifestations, other uh, neurological manifestations can be a paroxysmal dyskinesias, ataxia, paroxysmal ataxia, or choreotitosis. These, uh, these children can have developmental delay, intellectual disability as well. And uh, there is, uh, uh, it is uh, supposed to have a fluctuation of the symptoms with the kanga, fatigue, illness, or stress. Whenever the, we can ask the history that uh, whether these involuntary movements or these seizures are more so prior to feeding, that suppose the children are being fed at particular intervals, that is at a particular time, we can ask the mother whether these involuntary movements or these seizures are uh, are present prior just to uh, that is uh, feeding. So whenever there is a suggestive symptoms, uh, CSF, uh, CSF sugar uh, with the corresponding blood sugar has to be done. The absolute, uh, there is uh, some uh, controversies whether we have to consider the absolute CSF glucose as the important point for considering this uh, GLUT1 or we have to consider the CSF blood glucose ratios and uh, 
uh, whatever it is, if the absolute CS of glucose is uh, less than 60 milligram per deciliter, or if the CS of blood sugar value or ratio is less than 0.4, we have to consider GLUT1 deficiency, glu uh, that is glu glucose 1 transporter deficiency, and we should proceed with the genetic testing, SLC, that is solute carrier protein, 2A1 gene mutation. And the most important point is, this is an refractory epilepsy, which will not uh, respond to any of our conventional anti-seizure medication. And the treatment is ketogenic diet. So the moral is any child with refractory epilepsy and or movement disorder, we have to consider GLUT1. Ketogenic diet is the standard of care because ketones represent an alternate fuel for the brain. Only the glucose needs the transporter. So ketones doesn't require any transporter to be transported across the blood brain barrier and it represents the alternate fuel. So standard anticonvulsants are generally ineffective as they do not address the root cause. And uh, one more point as neurologists we have to con uh, we have to remember is phenobarbitone, sodium valproate, caffeine, diazepam, all these things can impede the glucose transport, hence to be avoided as anti-seizure medications in these kids. And uh, we have seen the biodidinase deficiency, which can present to us as uh, refractory seizures in infancy, along with the skin manifestations or cutaneous manifestations, such as alopecia, sparse hair, and uh, seborrheic dermatitis. But such a similar uh, presentation, clinical presentation, can also occur in a, another inborn error of metabolism, that is a copper deficiency or uh, problem in the copper metabolism. A four-month-old child, a firstborn of non-consanguineous parents, presented uh, with the recurrent seizures and failure to gain weight. And the examination revealed a sparse, brittle hair you can see in the cartoon. And uh, the child was lethargic, no neurocutaneous markers. Child had generalized uh, uh, hypotonia with the preserved reflexes. And the anterior fontanel was lax. There was no organometaly. And the metabolic parameters, including sugar, calcium, was normal. Ophthal opinion was normal. The discount vessels were normal. There was no optical trophy and the uh, urine screening tests were negative. So initially we considered a uh, biotidinase deficiency. We introduced biotin and we sent the uh, uh, serum sample for biotidinase level and uh, the serum biotidinase levels were normal. So the next possibility is we had to consider Menke's disease and uh, we did the serum copper level and serum ceruloplasmin level, both were low. And uh, MR eye brain was normal and the MR EA showed a tortuous blood vessels. So this is Menke's deficiency, uh, Menke's disease. This is an excellent recessive disorder which uh, with a mutation in the ATP7A gene. ATP7B gene, as we know, it, it, is, it causes Wilson. So it is 7A gene mutation. The incidence is one in 35,000 uh, live births. Here there is an impaired absorption and transport of copper. This intracellular copper deficit leads to dysfunction of the copper dependency enzyme. There are four enzymes which are important uh, in the metabolism. So this disease can present with the refractory seizures, developmental delay or developmental arrest and regression around eight to six to eight weeks of age. That can be hypotonia, cutis laxa and uh, kinky hair. Uh, on microscopic examination of the hair can show us a pilate or type. This is a diagnostic clue and there can be tortuosity of the intracranial vessels and uh, one can have subdural hematomas bilaterally. Sometimes on seeing the subdural hematomas in the, in the MRI, we will uh, we, did, we tend to uh, jump into a conclusion whether this could be a uh, non accidental trauma otherwise called as child abuse but we should remember that subdural bilateral chronic subdural can occur in menkes disease yet another uh, inborn error of metabolism which can have chronic subdural hematomas is glutaric aciduria type 1 as well and uh, this disorder is characterized by low serum levels of copper and ceruloplasmin and uh, the pathophysiology is hydrochrome oxidase deficiency can affect the cellular respiration, which is supposed to be the cause for CNS uh, uh, degeneration, seizures, and ataxia. Dopamine hydroxylase deficiency can lead to autonomic dysfunction in these kids. Lysyl oxidase deficiency leads to defective cross-linking of collagen, which can lead to connective tissue abnormalities and impaired blood, blood vessel integrity. Abnormal tyr tyrosinase is supposed to be the cause for skin hypopigmentation and the hair abnormalities are due to the sulfhydryl oxidase deficiency. So treatment will be copper histidine supplementation. This is, uh, has to be given subcutaneous or IM, usually in the dose of 200 to 1000 micrograms uh, per day can be given. Initial dose will be 125, 
then we can uh, at weekly intervals we can increase up to 250 or 500 like that depending upon the response and this has to be lifelong coming to the uh, sixth case scenario a four-year-old female child was born to third degree consumer's parents she presented with two episodes of afebrile generalized seizure over a period of one month there was no history of trauma ingestion of toxins prior seizures or family history of seizures she had a global developmental delay of which language uh, milestones were very much uh, affected as well as social and adaptive domains. She had an unevenful neonatal and perinatal period. Examination revealed a poor attention span with poor face-to-face -face contact. She was making just irrelevant sounds. She was communicating with her parents by gestures. There was a mild hypotonia with the preserved reflexes. She had poor in coordination the upper limbs as well as she had a wide based gait. There were no involuntary movements. Her head circumference was uh, low, coming to the uh, state of microcephaly. There were no dysmorphic features or neurocutaneous markers. Fundi were normal. Other system examination was normal. Thyroid profile, LFT, RFT were normal. Ophthal opinion was uh, normal and hearing evaluation was also normal. MRI showed bilateral symmetrical hyperintensity in uh, bilateral uh, globus pallidum. And uh, TMS, uh, thinking that it could be a... Um, uh, organic acidemia, we did the DMS, but it was negative. Urine organic acids were also negative. Lactate ammonia and the other possibility we thought was uh, mitochondrial uh, cytopathies. So serum lactate was done. It was also normal. Ammonia was normal. However, because of in view of bilateral symmetrical uh, hyperintensities, she was introduced on mitochondrial cocktail. Seizures, uh, for seizures, we gave levetiracetam. Uh, and additionally, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy were advised. There were no further seizures, but there were there was no gain in the cognitive milestones. Six months later, she presented with a, got readmitted with an acute onset of choreoatidosis, truncal and uh, gait ataxia, following two days of fever, cough, and cold. So MRI was repeated this time, including um, MRS, and it showed a this was the uh, MRI brain picture, which showed a bilateral symmetrical hyperintensity in the GP, and uh, this was her uh, MRS. We showed a low creatine peak or an absent creatine peak. This is the normal uh, MRS for comparison. So this was a disorder of creatine deficiency and uh, uh, creatine deficiency disorder. And the clinical exome sequencing identified a homozygous uh, nonsense variation in the GAMP gene. So she was introduced on creatine monohydrate in the, uh, in the dose of 400 milligram per kg per day. And additionally, scavenger, ammonia scavenger, such as uh, sodium benzoate was also given. There was improvement in the socio-cognitive skills. There are no more seizures, but speech impairment persists. So coming to the creatine deficiency syndrome, we, there are three, uh, three disorders. One is arginine glycyl amino transferase de deficiency. Another one is guanidino acetate methyl transferase deficiency. Both of these disorders are autosomal recessive inherited disorders. And the third one is the creatine transporter deficiency, which, is, uh, uh, which has an X-linked recessive pattern. So seizures are among these three disorders. Seizures are more prominent and more common with uh, GAMT deficiency. And again, the seizure can be of any type, myoclonic, any type. De associated uh, anomalies will be developmental delay, hypotonia, severe speech impairment as in our child, movement disorder, and autistic behavior as we have seen in our child. So coming to the creatine metabolism, whatever we take, so half of the creatine is from our dietary sources from uh, uh, meat and fish. And endogenously also creatine is, uh, 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 is, uh, is uh, secreted by or uh, it is uh, from the glycine, arginine and methionine amino acids it is formed. And uh, the first step in the creatine metabolism is glycine combines with arginine, it gets condensed to form guanidino amino acetic acid. So, and this uh, metabolic uh, reaction is uh, uh, for this sense, uh, for this uh, reaction, we need this enzyme, arginine glycine amino transferase. This is the first step in the creatine metabolism. The second step is this GA is uh, the this GAMT that is guadimino acetate methyl transferase enzyme transfers a methyl group from S adenosyl methionine to GA to produce creatine and the S adenosyl homocysteine. Creatine is then transported to the muscle and the brain through an, uh, using an sodium and chloride dependent creatine transporter. And uh, creatine plays a vital role for energy availability in the tissues. 
So here we could see glycine and arginine combined to form guadinido acetate by this enzyme. And uh, this enzyme, GAMT, transfers a methyl group from this one, SAM, to GAA to form creatine. Then creatine is transported across the blood-brain barrier through creatine transporter into the brain. So whenever there is an, uh, this uh, creatine deficiency lead to cerebral energy deficiency due to depletion of brain creatine and phosphocreatine. And apart from these things, in GIMT deficiency, we have accumulation of the guanindo amino acetate, which is neurotoxic. This has a direct agonist action on the GABA receptor, leading to their desensitization and the internalization, causing an increase in the excitato excitotoxicity. So how to distinguish these three disorders? All these three disorders will have a absent peak in the MRS, absent creatine peak in the MRS. If we do plasma creatine, in the first two disorders, the plasma creatine levels are low, whereas in creatine transporter deficiency, it will be normal. In the urine and plasma, if we do the guanindo amino acetate, it will be low in the first enzyme deficiency. Whereas in GAMT deficiency, it is elevated. Whereas in transported deficiency, it is normal. We can all also confirm the disease by the disorder by doing clinical exome sequencing. So once we have confirmed these disorders, then uh, once we suspect itself, I think uh, with the biochemical evidence and with the absent creatine peak in the MRS, we should go for creatine monohydrate because we have to supplement the creatine in the dose of 400 to 800 milligram per kg per day in four to six divided doses to restore the cerebral creatine. And dietary arginine restriction has to be done, which can reduce the GA accumulation. Again, sodium benzoate conjugates the glycine to reduce the GA levels again. And uh, pre-symptomatic treatment, once we have diagnosed these things in the by uh, newborn screening, before these children develop symptoms, this is effective in achieving the normal neurodevelopmental outcome. So the moral is any child with intellectual disability, language delay, epilepsy, autistic behavior, we have to consider creatine deficiency syndrome. We should always include MRS in such children to look for creatine peak. Coming to the last case scenario, this is a five month old male child, fifth born of third degree concern as parents, had LSES delivery prior at birth, but the child developed multifocal clonic seizures since day two of life. And the child had to be in the uh, neonatal intensive care for 40 days, ventilated for most of the time. And child was on uh, phenobobitone and clonazepam. And child got discharged on the 40th day. But within five days, child got readmitted with the tonic seizures and recurrent apnea. And there were myoclonic seizures also over the next few months. And the child had asymmetric infantile spasms as well. Child did not uh, attain any milestone on examination, child had spastic quadriparesis with the microcephaly. There was no dysmorphism or no neurocutaneous markers. And uh, on a detailed history, the mother revealed that the first child had developmental delay, had similar clinical picture with the spastic quadriparesis. Child expired at four years of age with microcephaly recurrent seizures. And the evaluation for that child, uh, ophthalm uh, ophthalmic evaluation did show bilateral optic atrophy and less lens dislocation. The, uh, the child expired at four and a half years of age and the next three were abortions. And this is the next child who was an alive child. So with the, such a history of refractory seizures, developmental delay, no gain in uh, milestones at all. And uh, with the lens dislocation, we suspected malubinum cofactor deficiency. And for this child, the metabolic parameters were normal. PSH was normal, TMS was negative. Serum uric acid was very low. And the MRI brain showed cystic encephalo, multi-cystic encephalomalacia. For this kid also, the ophthal opinion revealed a bilateral lens dislocation. And we did a urine sulfite levels, which was very high. Normal is less than 97 or 100. And this child showed 400 micromoles of uh, increased urine sulfite level. Exome sequencing showed a mutation in the malubinum cofactor gene. This was the uh, MRI, which, showed the, which shows the multi-cystic encephalomalacia. So malubinum cofactor deficiency typically presents in the first days of life, the first uh, few days of life with the severe encephalopathy, refractory seizures, recurrent apnea, opisotronic posturing. And this is an essential cofactor for uh, important three enzymes, xanthin uh, dehydrogenase, sulfite oxidase, aldehyde oxidase, 
toxic accumulation of sulfites uh, is exertive toxic and uh, clinical clue is low serum uric acid level. This is due to deficiency of xanthine dehydrogenase enzyme, which needs molybdenum cofactor for its action. And uh, urine will show elevated sulfite and xanthine and hyposanthine. And uh, here we can have three uh, genetic defects. Uh, guanosine triphosphate is actually converted to cyclic TMP with this uh, enzyme. And uh, this is considered as type A. Further, um, uh, this uh, type 2 and type 3 will have further uh, metabolic uh, reactions. Finally, molybdenum cofactor is developed. So if there is a proximal defect in the pathway of molybdenum cofactor synthesis, which results in the failure to convert uh, GDP to cyclic PMP, this is the problem with the Mox1 uh, defect. For this, we have to give cyclic PMP daily by infusion, uh, that is uh, IV, uh, sorry, uh, yes, see, uh, by eight in the dose of 80 to 160 microgram per kg per day, which is not available in our, uh, in our uh, country. And uh, with this, we can have a good seizure controlling and the improved developmental outcome, neurodevelopmental outcome. But uh, 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 this kid is only on multiple anticonvulsant, did not develop any milestone and the child is having a microcephaly spastic quadriparesis with the refractory seizures only. So how to investigate whenever we suspect a metabolic seizures, metabolic epilepsy in any child, how to proceed about? Tier 1 investigations will include plasma glucose, ammonia, lactate, ABG, serum amino acids, urine organic acids, and plasma acyl carnitine. That this serum amino acids and plasma acyl carnitine can be done in the tandem mass spectrometry itself. Whereas for urine organic acid can be only done by uh, your uh, GCMS. And uh, imaging studies, including MRI brain and the MRS to look for glycine peak as well as lactate peak, which can be present in mitochondrial cytopathies. We can do the video EEG because some of these seizures can be only electrographic. We may not see clinically over seizure. After uh, examination is very important because uh, as we have seen, these kids can have an optic atrophy or a lens dislocation, which can give us a clue. So when the, uh, this trial one investigation can lead on to uh, certain clinical clues or biochemical clues to find out the probable metabolic error, then we can go for a targeted gene, gene panel to uh, know the defective uh, pathogenic mutations. And uh, we have to go for a sequential therapeutic trial, first with pyridoxin. If there is no response, we have to go for a PLP, that is uh, uh, pyridoxal phosphate. If there is an uh, incomplete response, we have to proceed with the folinic acid uh, supplementation in addition to the uh, conventional uh, 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 anti-seizure medication. Tier 2 investigations will include CSFSA for CSF glucose to, uh, to diagnose glucose transporter deficiency, CSF lactate, amino acids, Pipacolic acid, neurotransmitters, 5-hydroxy, 5-methyl uh, tetrahydrofolate levels, serum copper, seruloplasmin, serum uric acid levels, urine sulfite, urine guanine. If there are some biochemical markers identified, then we can proceed with a single gene se se Sanger sequencing to find out the pathogenic mutation. If no biochemical marker is identified, then we have to proceed with the uh, clinical exome, then whole exome, then finally go whole genome sequencing. Specific therapies will be based on the diagnosis pyridoxin, folinic acid, biotin, ketogenic diet, dietary restrictions, detoxifying agents, that is ammonia scavengers or glycine scavengers such as sodium benzoate, and in addition to the conventional anti-seizure medication. So to summarize, don't think inborn errors of metabolism are rare, exotic, untreatable disorders, and they can present in, at any age of uh, any age from fetal life to older age. So a high index of suspicion is necessary. And uh, consider metabolic epilepsy, Whenever you find refractory seizures, which are refractory to conventional anti-seizure medications associated with concomitant developmental delay, movement disorders, whenever there is a history of parental consanguinity or there is a family positive family history. The clinical clues will be whenever we have a history of intrauterine seizures, that is, that, that is increased fetal movements during the antenatal period, consider pyridoxine dependency, pyridoxal phosphate dependency, and non-ketotic hyperglycemia. In the newborn, when there are persistent hiccups, consider non ketotic hyperglycemia. Whenever there is an alopecia or a skin rash, seborrheic dermatitis, consider biotidinase deficiency or Menke's disease. Whenever there is a lens dislocation, should point towards a malibdenum cofactor deficiency. Intermittent dyskinesias, refractory seizures, GLUT1. Intellectual disability, artistic behavior, movement disorder, paroxysmal movement disorders, then creatine deficiency syndrome because we have to necessarily 
uh, uh, should have a high index of suspicion to identify these things because these disorders are amenable to specific treatments and timely diagnosis is, is essential to prevent irreversible brain damage. Thank you. Thank you for patient hearing. Thank you, Thank you. Lima, for a nice exhaustive talk on metabolic features. Any questions from the audience? Kishore. Oh, yeah. I am Paraman. Yeah, Paraman, yes. Paraman. L Lima, Wanakam, Lima. Hello, how are you? Uh, uh, fine. Thank you, thank uh, you. Uh, you, you, uh, you are excellently uh, narrated. My question is, uh, you are summarized in the um, investigations are done in Tamil Nadu. He is asking whether all the investigations are uh, done. All in investigations Nadu are done. Are being done in your institute or at abroad? Metabolic, metabolic causes. Metabolic causes. Uh, uh, metabolic. Actually, we have an in house uh, tandem mass spectrometry at ICH for the past oh. uh, uh, probably three years. And uh, okay. but uh, it won't be, and uh, we cannot do it continuously because all these uh, consumables are uh, very highly costly. But uh, okay. in all the uh, labs outside, uh, we can do tandem mass spectrometry. This is only a direct. Uh, the, this is only a uh, filter paper test. We can uh, just the uh, we have to send in the filter paper just to pour drops of blood, and uh, uh, okay. it is being done at Nimans also for thousand hundred rupees. The cost is thousand hundred. So by doing TMS, uh, hyperglycemia serum elevated glycine levels can be uh, deducted, as well as uh, this inborn error, uh, the other inborn errors of metabolism, such as uh, your uh, amino acidopathies, urea cycle disorders, and organic acidemias, we can have a clue from the TMS itself. And the next thing is, and uh, for pyridoxine dependency, pyridoxal phosphate, biotidinase deficiency, and all, clinically, we have to proceed with the first any refractory seizures, First and foremost will be pyridoxin. So whether there is a uh, clinical response is there or not, we have to see. And uh, confirming is only by doing the genetic test by clinical exome sequencing. This uh, CSF oh. pipacolic acid or plasma pipacolic acid, alpha amino adipic acid, uh, semi-aldehyde levels are very high. They are costly. Uh, around uh, 10 to 15,000, we have to spell it out. And uh, okay. we, uh, uh, so it is better that we go for uh, clinical exome sequencing. But if there is a clinical response, then we have to con uh, we have to consider them and we have to con continue the pyridoxin. But for biotidinase, it is a very simple test. It is a very, everywhere it is available. Serum biotidinase level we can ask, and it is available in all the laboratories. Just five hundred rupees. Okay. So it is it can be done in, uh, in anywhere. And uh, okay. other uh, exome sequencing and all, it is only a genetic mutation test. Clinical exome sequencing, I think it is around, uh, uh, it, it will be around in thousands, probably uh, 13 to 15,000. Okay. Urine okay. sulfide, uh, some of the uh, things are being done at CMC well load. For government okay. hospital, it is a lower rate. For private hospitals, it is a little bit higher. Urine sulfide and all we have done in uh, CMC well load only. Serum biotidinase okay. levels, we don't do it in our hospital. We are uh, from the TMS, we can have a clue. C51 biochemical uh, abnormality is uh, which we can pick it up from TMS. It's uh, for biotidinase, it is uh, 5 hydroxy, uh, sorry, 3 hydroxy isovaleric acid. So if we have that uh, clue from the TMS, we use to send the serum biotidinase again to CMC. Window. There for Thank government you. hospital, it is done for just 150 rupees yes. in CMC. Okay. Right. So, what urine sulfide of... also we can do it in, uh, in uh, CMC Vellore. Urine guanidine, guanidines, again we can do it at CMC Vellore. Thank you. Okay, Lima. How Thank many you, cases Lima. of metabolic uh, epilepsies do you have in your institute? Uh, you around, uh, around the paradoxin dependency, we have around 20 cases. And the only two cases we have confirmed, the one is by our biochemical analysis uh, by doing this uh, AAS and the paper folic acid, which we have, I have shown in the, uh, in the slides. Another one is by genetic mutation studies. Uh, so only two are confirmed, but all the other uh, 16 to 18 cases, they have clinical response and they are on um, pyridoxin monotherapy, no more seizures, 
so they are uh, they are uh, pyridoxal so clinically we have uh, by clinical criteria they are pyridoxin dependent epilepsy and the biotinase uh, right now i am having uh, we are having around 10 cases and uh, one thing about biotinase deficiency is as early as uh, we pick up they have a good neurodevelopmental outcome otherwise seizure control is uh, very good excellent seizure control with the biotin therapy but uh, they do have developmental delays they do have language impairments so it is better that we pick up very early and the other things all uh, which i have showed you all our cases only and these are all single cases so if you ask me in the uh, in the uh, uh, according to the incidence or the prevalence the common one is which we pick up is pyridoxin then the next one is biotinase other things are single cases or one or two cases only. And uh, you, uh, organic acidemia, urea cycle disorders, and amino acidopathies like PKU or MSUD also can present to, can have seizures, but seizures are the not the um, uh, common manifestation. They used to present with the encephalopathy, developmental delay, metabolic acidosis, such things. So, uh, which we have discussed uh, so far are uh, seizures is the common presentation. This is the presenting manifestation. Seizures are the presenting manifestations. Would you advise some cocktail for the these children? Most of the time we don't do, we are not able to do investigation for kids. Would you suggest some cocktail for the for such the metabolic The flow will be uh, like uh, pyridoxin first. If there is no response with uh, pyridoxin 30 milligram per kg per day, uh, for seven days, then we have to go for pyridoxal phosphate, but it is uh, separately pyridoxal phosphate. It is available online, but uh, uh, commercially we don't have over the counters. That is the problem with the pyridoxal phosphate. If there is an partial response, then the next thing, folinic acid, it is very much available. Leucovarin is the tablet and uh, 50 milligram tablet is very much available that we have to go for. And the biotinase, I think... Uh, uh, we have biotin, we have to add a little bit of uh, tablet costs around 5 to 6 rupees, but it is very much available over the counter. 5 milligram tablet is available. So, in some of in, uh, in our 10 cases, one child did not have any cutaneous manifestation. So, it is better that we introduce biotin, biotin also. So, whenever there is an uh, cutaneous manifestation like uh, alope, uh, the sparse hair with uh, skin manifestations, so seborrheic dermatitis, it is very much with the refractory, with the seizures, it is very much essential that we have to add biotin immediately. And we proceed with the biotinase. Biotinase should not be a problem because it is very much available uh, in all the labs. It shouldn't be a problem to test serum biotinase level. Apart from that, uh, uh, apart from these three things, uh, if we suspect mitochondrial by your serum, elevated serum lactate, elevated C CSF lactate, MRI also shows something, then we can add by a mitochondrial cocktail. Mitochondrial cocktail will in include syrup carnitine 50 to 100 milligram per kg per day in divided doses, thiamine 300 milligram, riboflavin 100 milligram, biotin 10 milligram, CoQ. 30 milligram per day. So this is the mitochondrial cocktail, but uh, we need not uh, add mitochondrial cocktail, uh, think about mitochondrial cocktail for every child. Only we, we suspect from the clinically, biochemically and uh, imaging wise, then we can go for it. But uh, in any child with refractory epilepsy, we should necessarily consider pyridoxin, biotin, folinic acid. That combination, I think we can't do. Any other questions? PGs, DMPGs, Tariq. One more point is, it is uh, very easy to introduce, but when to stop, whether to stop or not, whether to continue them for lifelong, necessarily we have to investigate. That, uh, that aspect we have to uh, inform to the parent that uh, for how long we are going to continue this therapy, so necessarily you have to undergo these tests that we have to inform and uh, and uh, influence them to uh, go for the further testing. Thank you very much.
vote of thanks by naring thank you ma'am now i would like to invite uh, dr naring padam the neurology resident to give vote of thanks uh, thank you very much sir uh, good afternoon to one and all on this wonderful sunday as we got an opportunity to hear a very useful lecture today so on this uh, wonderful sunday it's my uh, privilege that i got a chance uh, to thank everyone present here so myself dr narang padun on behalf of department of neurology kbp medical college and mgm hospital and interpretative of the his, uh, institute uh, we take this golden opportunity to thank our uh, respected guest lecturer madam uh, c lima paulin uh, who spare time for us for uh, from her busy schedule thank you very much madam and enlightening and also very a uh, useful and wonderful topic which will be very useful for us in the daily practice uh, we got a lots of information uh, which we are very thankful you uh, very much madam for enlightening imparting and give a uh, depth insight into the topic with real many clinical scenario interesting with clue and how to tie up the approaches because all uh, Uh, metabolic uh, season seem to be similar so thank you very much madam we have no words to offer a gratitude for your uh, valuable presence today thank you very much madam and i also want to extend a thank to our hod department of neurology dr kishor sir for who worked so hard for this uh, event to happen and made this lecture possible for us and we got an opportunity to hear from madam on a very wonderful topic thank you very much sir and i also want to extend thank to all our associate and assistant professor for uh, their effort making this event possible and also thank to our my senior and my colleague for their work on this and i'm also thankful to uh, all fijis and everyone for attending classes last but not the least a big thank to each one of you who made this event possible thank you very much uh, everyone for being with us have a great day thank you Leave. Mama left. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 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 Hello, sir. Okay, okay, sir. Yes, sir. I can answer. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. I'll edit it and then. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, sir. Okay. thank you and um...